and we've got, got of a kind of a confluence of a handful of things over the last week or two, again, having to do with um, this issue inside of the world of education. So uh, I want to watch this video together, and we'll see if... Do one more. We have never invested as much in public education as we should have because we've always had kind of a private notion of children. Your kid is yours and totally your responsibility. We haven't had a very collective notion of these are our children. So part of it is we have to break through our kind of private idea that kids belong to their parents or kids belong to their families and recognize that kids belong to whole communities. Once it's everybody's responsibility and not just the households, then we start making better investments. So just, yeah, I know that went by pretty quick, but just so you know, that wasn't, you know, just some Twitter feed. That was actually broadcast on MSNBC, you know, one of these major networks and so forth. Yeah. Yes. Okay, so I'm being asked, what is the root of this belief? When this is the second week now, we've looked at something like this that has said we need to get rid of the notion that kids belong to parents and we need to replace it with the idea that kids belong to the community. And that's the only way for us to be able to move forward. Where does this come from? In 1844, Karl Marx um, publishes the Communist Manifest Manifesto. In the Communist Manifesto, he argues clearly without equivocation, abolish the family. It was absolutely necessary for his point of view to get rid of the family structure so that in his point of view, the correct economic revolution could take place. Workers were being oppressed by uh, capitalists and the owners of industry. And so the only way to correct that is to have this workers' revolution. And what was getting in the way between the workers' revolution and the communist paradise that he believed would occur were the other social institutions that gave people structure and meaning. So the family is one of those. The church is one of those. Education that is not controlled by the state is another one of those um, another one of those institutions that keep that revolution from happening. So he believed several things needed to be abolished, and one of them was the family. That idea did not go away. It gets redeveloped in the early 1900s, and people have been writing about this issue. Um, you know, so I start with Karl Marx, you know, 180 years ago, or whatever it is, and then we get to um, the 1920s. So since the 1920s, for 100 years now, the disciples of Karl Marx have been taking his ideas, been tweaking it, saying he was wrong here, but his big idea was right, so here's how we have to adjust it. They've been writing for 100 years the same thing. The institutions that keep the revolution from happening are the family, the church, education that is not state-sponsored, so we have to get rid of all of those things, and then we can have happen what should happen. And they are explicit about it and have been explicit for a hundred years now that not only should the state control education, and many of us are, are accustomed to and comfortable with public education. Heather and I both went through uh, public schools and we turned out okay, right? Um, the twitch is invisible now, so you, we, we're, we're fine. So that's, public education is one thing, but the notion of state controlled education is a different thing. What she is after is what this critical theory woke uh, Marxist universe has been after for a very long time explicitly. Separate kids from parents, re-educate them, and then, then by the time they go back home to visit their parents, they're entirely unrecognizable. So this is cultural Marxism. <clears throat> I know that went by really quickly, but I love the way this kind of thing is is talked about in public. So she is saying the reason that we haven't funded schools the way that we're supposed to is that way too many people still believe that kids belong to parents. So if we finally have a communal view of education, the implication then is that's the only time that we're going to get appropriate funding into the schools is we have to change our belief about who owns kids. And she uses the language of ownership. 
who owns kids. They belong to the community. All right. <clears throat> so she makes some of these arguments, and I want to roll another thing into the middle of this, come back to it, and talk about some of those specifics. Um, this author, um, if you're interested in tracking specifically the issue of um, education in the U.S. and a lot of these issues that come to the surface, you're going to want to find this guy, Christopher F. Rufo. So he's um, an investigative a journalist, essentially, but he's right on the cutting edge of um, discovering the curriculum in schools that does strange things and helping parents um, deal with uh, school boards when school boards are doing crazy things. Um, so he's got his own newsletter, his own website. Um, some of you may have seen this hit the surface uh, a little while ago. Um, parents stopped the state of California from forcing students to chant to the Aztec god of human sacrifice. So here's part of what he reports. The curriculum recommends that teachers lead their students in a series of indigenous songs, chants, and affirmations, including the in lock Ek affirmation, which appeals directly to the Aztec gods. Students first clap and chant to the god Tezcatlipoca. I practiced that. I have no clue if that's correct or not. Whom the Aztecs traditionally worshipped with human sacrifice and cannibalism, asking him for the power to be warriors for social justice. So we are way beyond the um, we shouldn't have prayer in schools debate. I mean, that debate is so yesterday. <laughs> it is now a question, and this is state of California curriculum. This isn't um, one school in the middle of San Francisco somewhere, you know, whatever the case may be. This was state of California curriculum that they had sort of put in the curriculum without parent, parental review, all that good stuff, right? Chanting to the Aztec god of human sacrifice, um, and the kids are being asked to pray to this god, for the power to become warriors for social justice. So a couple of thoughts. And we've, we've done this kind of thing, right? What's most important about these little segments is reflecting on them uh, logically, reflecting on them biblically, uh, thinking through and not just going, oh man, isn't that ridiculous, isn't that awful, but actually giving um, vocabulary to what we're thinking as Christians when we look at this stuff. So the video that we watched. This is important to recognize. When the woke world or a socialist or a communist uses the word community, they don't mean community. They mean the state. They mean us. So when she says we need to have this view that children belong to the community, a couple of things happen at the same time when that word is used. So oftentimes when the word community is used, it comes with this sort of nice, fluffy, neighborhood, backyard, friendship kind of feeling. We have community because we go to a small group and we eat together and it's good for us. So it's loaded with, this, with these positive vibes, right? <clears throat> the second thing that happens when she uses that word is she wants you to think that when she means something else entirely. She means you give me your children and your money and I will educate them the way that I think they should be educated. That's what she means by that. <clears throat> they always mean the state. So she does not intend to imply that your kids belong to you and your kids belong to you. That's not what she means. Your kids belong to me. That's, that's what the language means. This is one of the primary issues that we have right now with the definition of socialism and why so many people think they are socialists when they are not. <clears throat> so you look up, you can Google it, a lot of, um, of the, the standard definitions of socialism or communism that are floating out there use the word community instead of the word state. So you know how when you Google just a single word on Google, um, the first thing they do is they give you sort of their um, definition of that word. Their definition of that word is socialism is that uh, the means of production belong to the community as a whole. 
Well, that's one way of defining socialism, but that's not what socialism is. Means of production belong to the state. They don't belong to the community, right? So these is, this, is, this is how these word games continue to get played. Notice this as well. The woke universe admits every god but God. They will allow prayer to any deity into schools except for the one deity who does actually exist, right? <clears throat> so I like this thought. Satan does not care if you worship him as the state or as an Aztec deity or as nothing at all. He doesn't care as long as you don't worship the one true God. So he's not bothered <clears throat> by any of this. But somehow we've gotten to this point where now the woke world is not atheists trying to keep prayer out of schools. They just don't want Christian prayer in schools. But, you know, they're okay with this kind of prayer. So what Eric is saying is correct. That, well, you know, even if you don't believe in any particular God, all these things are used as a kind of metaphor for whatever you want to place on that or in that, whatever meaning you want to place inside of that, and then draw some sort of whatever energy or inspiration from that. But the one true God does not allow that to happen. The one true God is dangerous, <clears throat> which is why polytheists, pantheists, atheists do not want the one true God inside of schools because he's dangerous. He's just dangerous when you do that. <clears throat> and this is also important for you and I as followers of Jesus Christ, this is a big deal. This is the kind of thing we could, we could argue about all night long or describe all night long, but this is important. It is entirely rational to advocate for God in public while refusing to allow cannibalistic demons into the public square. It's entirely rational. So the Christian, you know, the, the comeback will often be, well, if you want to have prayer to your God in school, then you have to allow prayer to every God in school. I say, well, okay, if you're thinking politically, I, I sort of understand what you're saying, but I'm going to think about reality for a couple of seconds. The one true God is the one true God, and the Aztec cannibal God is not a God, and you don't want that demon being worshipped inside of school. So it's entirely rational for the Christian to deny that pushback and say, well, I believe that things that are true should be in public, and things that are false can be shown as false in public. It's an entirely rational argument to make. The one true God is true. These other gods are false. The one true God is good. And these other gods are evil. So it's entirely rational to say, I'd rather have the true and the good in public and what is false and evil not in the public. All right, so a little bit more of our week and woke. This education stuff just keeps coming up. So uh, I just thought, well, it's, a, it's fun to watch another one of these videos where some educator who I don't know this for sure, but usually they don't have biological children of their own, um, but they want your children inside of their system. That, that's what they want. 